Welcome to America's Endless Counterterrorism War in Yemen, a strategic assessment, uh, New America online event. Uh, we're going to hear from David Sturman, who's written uh, a very interesting new paper, America's Endless Counterterrorism War in Yemen. Appropriately, uh, I think the first drone strike in Yemen was, in fact, in 2002, so we're still 20 years later. New America also welcomes Dr. Gregory Johnson and Dr. Alexandra Stark to provide comments on the report. Dr. Johnson is a non-resident fellow at the Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. Between 2016 and 2018, he served on the Yemen panel of experts for the UN Security Council. He holds a PhD from Princeton, who's the editor of the Yemen Review, um, and is the author of the excellent book, The Last Refuge, Yemen, Al-Qaeda, and America's War in Arabia, which is a very well-thumbed book in my, in my library. Um, and also our colleague, Dr. Stark, uh, she is a senior researcher with New America's Political Reform Program, holds a PhD from Georgetown. Uh, her work has particularly focused on something that is highly relevant to this discussion, which is the proxy warfare strategy of the Gulf monarchies, obviously a key issue in Yemen. Um, so we'll hand it over to David, um, senior policy uh, senior policy analyst at New America, to, to talk about some of the headlines from his paper, and then um, Alex, maybe if you want to comment, and then Greg comments, and then we'll open it up for a wider discussion. David, thanks. So there's a lot in this report. It covers um, three administrations plus a little bit of the Bush administration, but I'm going to try and give the quick overview. The core argument of this report is that the counterterrorism war in Yemen, specifically the American counterterrorism war, is an endless war. And by that, I mean a war which I define as um, a war where a belligerent is pursuing objectives that it cannot achieve, yet at the same time, that belligerent is not at risk of being defeated either by being destroyed itself, nor by being denied access to the battlefield to pursue its war. Um, the impetus for this report is seeking to reply to, um, in addition to providing an update on the American counterterrorism war, is to reply to a range of commentary over the past couple of years that have contended that the concept of endless war is nothing more than a political slogan or talking point. Um, I believe that the arguments in this report provide a strong case that it's important to name the Yemen war or the US counterterrorism war in Yemen as an endless war. And that, that actually tells us something about the conflict. Two things just for clear that this report is not, it is not a deep dive into the Yemeni local context. I am not a Yemen expert. This is a report focused on American strategy and decision-making. And second, it's not a report on the current internationalized civil war, which is certainly intertwined with the American counterterrorism war. But in my view, the counterterrorism war, what some have termed the drone war, is really a separate conflict that needs to be analyzed in its own right. So what is the quick history of that conflict? Really quick. In the 1990s, Al-Qaeda and bin Laden start organizing a network hub in Yemen in the 2000s or in 2000, you get a couple of attacks. Um, most notably, you have the USS Cole bombing, then Al-Qaeda's networks get a little bit degraded. By 2006 to 2008, they're back on the rise. In 2009, as Obama is inaugurated, they announced the merger term with um, remnants of the Saudi network that had been relatively crushed. Um, they termed that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, um, as we know it now, the United States perceives rightly that to be a growing threat to the homeland and other U.S. interests. By December, in December 2009, the United States is conducting direct unilateral airstrikes or cruise missile strikes are the initial ones, I believe. In Yemen, there was one such strike under the Bush administration in 2002. But really, this war, as we understand it now, and it's more over unilateral form takes off under the Obama administration. The same month, Al Qaeda in Yemen um, carries out an attack inside the United States where a Nigerian by the name of Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, um, who had been studying in Britain, travels to Yemen, gets training and a bomb from Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. 
brings it back to the United States or brings it to the United States where he detonates it on a civilian flight over Detroit. The bomb luckily fizzles. If it had not, it would have likely killed 200 plus people. Um, al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula then pursues two further attacks on aviation or attack plots on aviation that are disrupted in 2010 and 2012, as well as some other plots. They grow as an insurgency in the wake of the Arabian Peninsula or in the wake of the Arab Spring. They lose some territory. We have the current civil war, bout of the civil war takes off. They gain some territory, they lose it. US strikes spike to an unprecedented 131 in Donald Trump's first year. And then they decline to where they may or may not be paused, which is basically where we are now. So that is the rapid fire history of this war. As I'm telling it, I'm sure there's a lot more, but just to situate people. So why do I call it an endless war and what gave rise to it? Well, I gave the definition above, but I identify in this report four factors that I think have given rise to endlessness in this war. The first, as is core to the definition, um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and other jihadist groups, including the Islamic State in Yemen, are not capable of destroying the United States. I don't think we need to spend much time on that. Really, no terrorist group is capable of posing an existential threat to the US, but neither are they capable of denying the US access to the battlefield. Um, the United States conducted at least a single strike, often more every year between 2009 and 2020. Um, they may have paused strikes in 2021 and so far this year, although it's not exactly clear whether there have been US strikes or not. Um, but if there is a pause, that's not because the United States is not capable of carrying out a strike. And indeed, we still have US personnel on the ground in small numbers in Yemen, at least according to a 2021 war powers letter from the Biden administration. So we are set up in a condition where Al Qaeda cannot win this conflict. They cannot push the US out absent a decision by US decision makers to do so. And at the same time, the United States has been pursuing wildly expansive objectives, originally set under the Obama administration. Um, you had strategy documents talking about the defeat or total destruction of Al Qaeda, including its affiliates, a wide ranging war to destroy the network. Um, in my view, those objectives are not accomplishable. Um, both, if you look, Al Qaeda has a long history in Yemen. So, and it has a history of resurging and coming back after being diminished, which suggests that this kind of dream of a total victory or decisive victory is probably not possible. At the same time, Al Qaeda and its networks have decentralized in key ways, which raises the question of what even would a victory be when um, Al Qaeda is able to, or people, even if you smash the organization, can brand new rising organizations as it. It eases the possibility of demonstrating continuity with the former organization, something that the group has steered into in recent propaganda releases. And then finally, the current conflict and more broadly grievances in Yemen create an environment that is conducive to um, the grievances that can fuel jihadist organizing as well as just um, opportunity to engage in armed struggle. Um, there can also be expansive objectives regarding transformative aims of changing the Yemeni context, or even disruptive ones, although those tend to be less expansive. Um, but the third factor is that the United States has often adopted unclear or shifting aims, moving between this kind of unlimited vision of destroying Al-Qaeda in its entirety and discussion of more limited disruptive aims, degrading Al-Qaeda's external attack capability, but this has never really been clarified to what specifically is being sought. In addition, at the beginning, at least, the war was waged covertly, which preventing, prevented the kind of public stability of what the objective was, and many of the potentially limited objectives that might accept some continued existence of Al-Qaeda um, were presented as gerunds or processes. So, the objective is degrading Al-Qaeda, or our objective is to degrade Al-Qaeda's capabilities. Now, that might sound limited and that it's not a claim to defeat, but if you don't say what the endpoint or how much degradation is necessary, 
what fills in as the projected endpoint is actually those continued references, however merely rhetorical they seem to be, that the endpoint is actually destroying the group. And then finally, the US has had limited efforts at war termination planning. Its partners um, are highly constrained and with the functional collapse of much of the Yemeni government, it limits on its partners in the Emiratis and Saudis and uh, basically total lack of any leverage over the Houthi rebels who are increasingly playing a key role in much of Yemen. So those are the conditions I argue have generated endlessness. Another argument of this report is that the threat from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has declined radically since 2009. In 2009, when this war was escalated or started, depending how you want to count the O2 strike in that early period, there were repeated government statements about credible plots and threats against the United States from Al-Qaeda, both in um, South Asia and Yemen. We know about multiple plots, including the actual Christmas Day attack inside the United States, which if it had been successful, would have killed hundreds and was not disrupted really by US efforts, but largely by the luck and challenges posed by um, to Al Qaeda's plotting, but was not detected beforehand. You also had the 2010 and 2012 plots. By 2022, um, or this year, I'll, we find that the US government has repeatedly assessed that it has no evidence of credible specific plotting activity, plots against the United States homeland by foreign terrorist organizations, whether Yemen or elsewhere, even as the Islamic State rose in Syria to an unprecedented side of power for a jihadist organization, the US government continued to assess that that group did not pose a direct credible threat inside the United States, although it certainly directed attacks in Europe. Um, and then also, if we just look at, there's no examples of recent plots that are similar to the aviation plots out of Yemen against the US homeland. We know of no cases like that. Then finally, the kind of travel that Abdul Muttalib and a range of other people engaged in, where they were able to travel to Yemen, get training, connect with the group, and then return to the West or come to the United States is really not possible today, in part because of the Civil War, in part because of greater attention that began with the Christmas Day attack, and in part because of the pandemic. Um, that probably will not be permanent and is certainly not a particularly moral way of degrading the threat from al-Qaeda in Yemen, but it's something that needs to be accounted for when assessing the threat. Um, so today, the threat the war is being waged on what is largely a preventive logic of fears of what Al-Qaeda could become rather than degrading the group itself to a specified endpoint, which has both moral and strategic challenges that I explore in the paper. So one response to this we've seen from the administration is to move a bit away from the logic or focus on defeating Al-Qaeda to what it terms sustainable counterterrorism. Um, I do think this may be a first step towards ending the endless wars, and there's very many, there are parts of it that require praise. However, my fears that I express in this report is that it does not actually fill the strategic hole um, regarding what the US objective is. Instead, it dispenses at least somewhat with the language of seeking defeat but it doesn't specify what short of defeat is desired in Yemen or Somalia. In the speech by Dr. Liz Sherwood Randall that sort of put forth the strategy, um, Yemen and Somalia do not appear by name in that speech. It also tends to generate or amp up the sort of preventive watch or fear of growing threat tied to military action that does not require a new authorization or debate over starting a new war and what those objectives might be. It ends up being simply an amping up of the current conflict. And it also just tends to assume that over time conditions will get better, which at least to me looks a little bit like the strikes in 2009, where there were similarly a very small number of direct US strikes and an assumption that the US was actually on the way towards victory, that then the wave of protests and other destabilization in the Middle East really collapsed and generated these radical extensions in Yemen and also in Syria and Iraq, where strikes and conflicts grew rapidly. Um, 
So what should the United States do? Well, I think we need to chart a policy approach that seeks to actually end the endless war um, as distinct from what might be viewed as a sustainable counterterrorism framework or a policy of really amping up the commitment to the unlimited objective of destroying um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. I think that means that the United States needs to limit and specify what its objectives are. Its objectives are any objectives that have the continued use of military force need to be stated clearly, preferably in a presidential speech that should also discuss the actual history of the US war. We need a radical expansion of transparency, both on how many strikes and one strikes were conducted in the war over the past two decades, as well as reporting after every strike in a timely manner. Currently, there appear to be strikes that are recognized by parts of the US government in 2020 that CENTCOM does not acknowledge, partially because they were probably conducted by other arms of the US government covertly, but they've been semi-acknowledged by parts of the government, yet we don't have a clear record of those. Um, but also we need transparency on what the threat to the United States is from Al Qaeda. We need to repeal or at least reform and restrict the authorization for the use of military force and expand the war termination planning. Finally, before I turn it over to Alex, I think it's important to note that each of those things need to be pursued together. Otherwise, you just shift the war into a different form of endlessness that may be driven more by the expansive aim or by unclearing and shifting objectives. But if you don't address both and also the war termination issue, the endlessness will continue. Um, and with that, I turn it over. Alex. Yeah, uh, great. Thanks so much um, for including me in, the, in this conversation, David. I appreciate it. And I enjoyed reading your report, so I hope uh, folks will go to the New America website and check it out. Um, I had two kind of thoughts that uh, build off of, of your findings, maybe. So um, I, I'm really glad that your report draws attention to, to the US counterterrorism war in Yemen specifically. And, and I also really appreciated your emphasis on transparency because I think um, while we do sometimes at least uh, talk about U.S. support for the Saudi-led coalition's intervention in, in Yemen in, in kind of popular media and our conversations around Yemen, um, there's comparatively less attention to this aspect to the U.S. in, in the United States anyway. Um, and, and I study the other dy dynamics of the war, so that's not a, a knock on that um, approach, but I, I think this does need more attention. Um, we know from recent reporting and investigations that U.S. counterterrorism operations in, in places like um, Iraq and Syria, for example, uh, Afghanistan, have had much larger impacts on civilians and, and have likely incurred much higher numbers of civilian casualties than has been previously reported or, or publicly understood. So I think uh, we just don't really know nearly enough about the effects of the counterterrorism, uh, U.S. counterterrorism operations in Yemen specifically. Um, we also know, I think, comparatively little uh, from the research side about the utility of drone strikes in a broader framework of counterterrorism. So we, we when you see studies of this, we, we tend to measure effectiveness um, in terms of, you know, how many terrorists are killed or is there some kind of short-term change in the tempo of, an op of the operations that uh, a terrorist group is able to, to carry out following a drone strike? But we really, I think, know very little about the, the systematic ways um, that, for example, civilian populations view drones. Um, we, don't, we know comparatively little about how counterterrorism campaigns have led the US to support repressive dictators like Ali Abdel al-Sala. Um, Ali Abdel Saleh, who was able to, you know, collect rents from, from U.S. counterterrorism support uh, and from that security partnership for, for a decade. Um, so I suspect that if there were to be more investigation, if we were to learn more about, about the U.S. counterterrorism war in Yemen publicly, um, especially about the civilian casualty side, frankly, I think there would be much more conversation um, in the United States amongst policymakers about um, ending the counterterrorism war. Um, and, and David, exactly as you point out in, in your findings, this is important because under the Biden administration, so far we have seen a decline uh, 
um, in, in the number of drone strikes kind of across the board as the administration, it seems like, is undergoing um, this internal policy review. But it's not at all clear that the, that that um, that that kind of uh, steady state will be institutionalized or will be carried forward in any way. Um, the second thing that comes to mind is, I, I think this this is a really important moment to be rethinking U.S. counterterrorism policy. Um, you know, as, as the U.S. presence in Afghanistan drew down last year, as as the Biden administration is conducting this internal review. Um, there's also a push in the, the national defense strategy and, and perhaps in the national security strategy when it eventually comes out to kind of prioritize great power competition um, over other competencies in other areas of the world. So I, I think all of that means that this is potentially a, a really important moment for, for that kind of fundamental rethink. Um, the current approach is exactly as, as you outlined. Um, looks like a, a military first light footprint approach where the U.S. is, uh, at least from the U.S. side, is using drones and partnering with governments to car carry out counterterrorism combat operations. Um, but, but this approach doesn't really account for the underlying factors that led to the emergence of, of terrorist groups or allowed them to flourish. Um, and it doesn't have a long-term component looking at how to actually help to stabilize societies, how, how, how to um, invest in sustainable economic development, for example. Um, and it also ignores the voices of people on the ground, which I think is really important to note. So, you know, maybe we can be asking, how can we look to local peace building processes and, and, and local ways of building societal resilience to terrorism um, and to other kinds of political violence and then how can we maybe support those efforts or expand on those efforts uh, to build a longer term, more sustainable approach that isn't just kind of predicated um, on, on violence, on decapitating, decapitating terrorist leadership, kind of that over and over again approach that you outlined. Great. Thank you, Alice. Greg? Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks to both David and, and Alex and of course you, Peter. Um, yeah, and so I just want to make a couple of comments and then end with with a couple of questions for for David that I think build on on some of his some of his work in this paper. So first, I think it's a great paper. I, I would encourage everybody who is listening, if you haven't read it, do read it. I think what David does that adds a lot of value here is so often when you read these types of papers, you get one side or the other. You get a very US centric focus or you get a very AQAP centric uh, focus. And I think what David has done very well is, is balance that and give us both a really good and concise history of, of Al Qaeda and not only a history of how the organization has waxed and waned over time, but also evaluating the threat that that organization poses, um, particularly to, to the West. And so I think that's that's one of the real strengths of this paper. Another strength is that he really interrogates and I think does an, does an excellent job at getting at sort of how the U.S. has been in, in really a reactive posture over the past two decades in Yemen with, with constantly shifting policy goals and aims as, as he does a really good job of, of laying out in the paper. So I'll just make a couple of points on on each of those things and then go into my question. So one, I, I think when you when you read this paper and, and it's something that you know, someone sitting in David's position, I think, has a really excellent viewpoint because you can look back and we have the benefit of retrospect now. And so in 2009, as, as David talked about in his remarks, as he covers in his paper, AQAP is presenting this threat to the Obama administration. It's not an existential threat, but certainly it's, it's a threat that is uh, a challenge to the U.S. administration and to the Obama administration policy and what they want their focus to be on. And it, as David rightly points out, if the underwear bomber had been successful in bringing down the, the airliner over Detroit, we're looking at a much different situation probably today than we were then. I think that David does a really good job of laying out how since that point from 2009 to really 2020, um, that basically what happened is that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, their international terrorist wing, the, the, or, the, 
the sort of node of the organization that was focused on threats in the US is atrophied. And, and I think David points out a couple of good reasons for this. One is that you have all these US drone strikes. Yes, there were a number of civilian casualties as Alex rightly points out, but also a number of leaders within AQAP were killed in drone strikes from Anwar al-Awlaki to Nasr al-Waheshi, Saeed al-Shihri, Qasem al Raimi. The list goes on and on and on. And so you have the eradication of these key Al-Qaeda leaders. And at the same time, as David points out, with the rise of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, you have sort of a shrinking of the recruiting pool. So you, AQAP basically has a weak bench that these key leaders are being removed and nobody else is coming in to, in to replace them. I think the question um, that this then leads to, and I think one of the things that I'd be interested in David talking about a little bit further, is there seems to be an assumption here that AQAP is in decline. And I absolutely agree with you, David. I, I think AQAP is fractured, it's fragmented. The organization can't agree on who the new leader is. There's splinter groups, there's bickering back and forth. There's a lack of trust, frankly, within the organization about other members within the organization because um, it's been so well infiltrated by Saudi spies, um, electronic intercepts, signal intelligence, all of these things. But there does seem to be an assumption that the group is in decline and it's going to continue to decline. And as I think you rightly point out in your paper, we've seen AQAP from 2004 to 2006, for instance, look like the organization had been defeated in Yemen and then something happens and it sort of comes back. And so the question that I would have, at least on this side of the, uh, on the AQAP side, is if something does happen, if say Saudi, you know, imagine a scenario in which Saudi Arabia and the UAE withdraw, um, the war in Yemen sort of devolves uh, almost solely into a local civil war where you have all these various sides. So AQAP hasn't really been strengthened by the current war where we just entered the eighth year of this war. If you start it from sort of this, the Saudi beginning of military operations, AQAP has been fractured and fragmented. But imagine a scenario in which there's a local civil war and all of a sudden, just like in, say, 2009, 2010, 2011, Yemen once again becomes a destination on the jihadi circuit, and AQAP begins to sort of resurrect itself up from the ashes of earlier defeats, very much like we, what we've seen from history. So I, that would be my question is, A, can AQAP um, sort of reverse this decline? And B, if it does that, what, what does that mean for US policy? So that's one question. And then I'll just talk on the US side really briefly, ask another question and then sort of end my remarks. Um, I think you do an excellent job. And again, I would really encourage everybody listening to, to check out the paper. David does such a great job of interrogating what the US has been doing and how the US has been so sort of back footed for the last two decades, particularly in Yemen and looking at, okay, this might be an issue. So now our policy is this and our policy is never really articulated. We're just reacting in this particular way. And that, that part of the paper for me was, I, I think really well written, really strong, how it is is that the US has these shifting goals that it can never quite reach. And the, the question that I would have, as I think Alex rightly said, talking about the national defense strategy, there's been this shift away from sort of CT counterterrorism toward great power competition or a realization that, as you point out, David, these asymmetric threats are, are not an existential challenge to the United States. But I wonder what you would say to someone in the defense community who says, look, we can't just repeat this sort of boom and bust when it comes to counterterrorism, that everything is counterterrorism and now everything is great power competition. We have to learn and, and actually institutionalize some of the lessons over the last two decades. And so we don't want to forget all these hard, you know, so much blood, so much treasure has been lost over the last two decades. These have really been hard earned lessons. And we don't want to lose those capabilities, that institutional knowledge, and that capacity. And at the same time, we realize, yes, AQAP is not the threat that it once was, but it may, it may once again emerge as a challenge. And so the, the policy that we have right now, which is basically an over the horizon, you know, we have some drone bases. When we see a threat, we'll take it out. But it's really, as you point out, there have been very few strikes in 2021. I don't think there have been any, maybe one reported or, or at least rumored strike in 2022. So it's a very, very low level. And I wonder what you would say to someone in, in the DOD who says, look, this war is basically already ended. 
what we have right now is simply an institution and a, and a management of what will be a chronic condition in the Middle East. And so, yeah, we're shifting our focus to great power competition, but we're doing that in a responsible way. That means that we're not going to throw out the counterterrorism lessons of, of the last 20 years. And so those would be my two, two questions to you. And again, just, um, you know, great. I think it's a fantastic paper. So, so please read the paper. So kudos to you, David, on, on really a, a well-written and tightly argued paper. Yeah, thanks to you both. Um, I guess I'll start with a quick reply to those two questions that I think are really core to the argument. And I think also we'll touch on um, Alex's key points as I answer them as well. Um, First, to the first question, I, I take very seriously the potential of an Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula resurgence um, in the future. I think that is a very real risk. I, one of my complaints actually with the sustainable counterterrorism approach is I, I don't think it actually takes that risk seriously. It just um, projects forward a constant low level of strikes um, or even no strikes with the AUMF ongoing in the future, but no reckoning with um, what would be the response if there is a substantial increase in the threat or if um, political conditions change. And I think one of the issues with some discussion of endless war or some uses of the frame, in my view, is that it can come to equate endless war with um, any sort of military planning or preparation or the potential for renewed wars in the future. And I think the United States and Americans should be um, very much considering that it is likely the US will fight um, more wars in the Middle East against jihadist terrorist organizations in the future. I mean, hopefully, I think in a hopeful world, maybe trends point us away in a sustainable fashion from the past two decades, but I certainly wouldn't bet heavily on that. Um, but when it comes to US policy, my I think it's important when considering those potential to separate them into new wars, because otherwise what we end up with um, is the sort of wars or military action that sufficiently degrades the threat to the point where it become, it falls below the level of threat that initiated the violence or violent response to begin with. And then it sort of falls off the radar. Um, and I think once you hit that low level, there's both strategic concerns about, are you actually sustainably achieving objectives if you're just pushing it down to that, but you have to keep your finger and by finger, I mean ongoing drone strikes and targeting um, over decades. But also, I think there's moral concerns about the dominating position that puts the United States in over Yemenis to constantly keep the threat of drone strikes already authorized um, in case we in the DC choose to view a potential threat as increasing. Um, and I think that has moral concerns about whether actual members of Al Qaeda, as Neil Renich argues, are actually legitimate targets according to Western theories of just war. Um, I think it also undermines our moral claims about why terrorism is immoral or wrong if the US conducts violence in such a low level of threat um, while also having this asymmetry where we're not targetable. Um, so those, those are some substantial concerns I have with the constant aspect. I think it also can undermine if the US does need to wage a war for a truly transformative aim, um, we need to be able to talk about exactly what that is and what that transformation looks like. And the sort of constant military posture of ongoing twilight war prevents analysis of um, what can the United States actually achieve. Um, and I fear with pursuing some of that is, I question whether some um, 
some of those aims are really achievable by the United States in Yemen or are in the US interest, and particularly in the context where the bigger threat to um, Yemenis and others is the current internationalized civil war. And I don't think a sort of ramp up to a large scale transformative approach via warfare would be productive. Um, I do think clearly there needs to be work that's not war oriented as Alex pointed out and is a failure of a significant amount of um, the anti endless war commentary on Yemen is it leaves that out. I think not all of it, and I think it's often dismissed how much of that is going on, but it is a problem with some representations. Okay, um, we'll be using Slido to submit questions. Slido is the box located to the right of the video uh, if you want to submit a question. Um, so question for Alex and, and, and for Greg. Um, now that we have this ceasefire in Yemen, um, you know, how, does this, how does that affect A, Yemen, and B, this discussion? Alex, maybe if you start. Yeah, so the, um, the ceasefire, the truce that you mentioned um, just came into effect over the past weekend um, for, for Ramadan. It should, is supposed to last two months and could be renewable. Um, it has, in addition to pausing the, the fighting itself, there are some other elements. Um, there are, I think, two commercial flights that will be allowed into Sana'a Airport per week, which is um, significant because that, the airspace is controlled by uh, the coalition and by the internationally recognized government, even though uh, the airport on the ground is controlled by the Houthis in the north. Um, there's also an agreement to let a certain number of fuel ships into Hodeida port, which is um, also important because um, about 70% of Yemen's imports, uh, food, fuel, other, other stuff comes in through that port. Um, and, and the international inspection mechanism has kind of been held up as a way to block, um, to block uh, imports coming in. So I think, um, I usually think of these two wars as kind of, they're, they're happening in the same space or two wars, many wars, depending on to what level you, you get to, um, as happening in the same space, but kind of in parallel because Al-Qaeda um, is, isn't really a combatant involved in that internationalized civil war uh, necessarily. It's um, between two sides that aren't particularly amenable to AQAP, frankly. So um, I, I think as Greg pointed out, the, the concern that this conflict could kind of lead a, a vacuum that could help um, Al Qaeda and other other terrorist groups to flourish. What was there at the beginning, but actually did not necessarily prove to be as much of a, a problem as some had thought. Um, AQAP did did occupy Mukalla, for example, but um, the United States and, and Emiratis worked together to to push back against that. So I I think of them as not being entirely kind of politically connected, if that makes sense. But I, I, I do really, um, I, maybe I'm too optimistic. I, I really hope that the truce will end up supporting a, a more long-term peace process around that conflict. And that I think could help in turn kind of um, help lead to a reassessment of, of the, the US counterterrorism war in Yemen. Yeah, I mean, those are great points, Alex. I, I think the, the truce, I'm not particularly optimistic that it'll last all two, two months. Um, there have been some violations already. It comes at a really interesting time. Obviously, it, it began, it coincided with the first day of Ramadan, as, as, as Alec mentioned. It also, it, it also comes at a time when U.S. Gulf relations are at a particular low point. Um, Saudi Arabia and the U.S., obviously, both with Ukraine, but also with the U.S. pulling out Patriot missile batteries and sending them back. Um, the UAE and in the U.S., um, there's a I think a real crisis in the relationship right now. You have a situation where then the head of CENTCOM, General McKenzie, visited the UAE. Mohammed bin Zayed refused to meet with him, and then a couple of weeks later, Mohammed bin Zayed, the the de facto ruler of the UAE, is meeting and greeting publicly Bashar al-Assad. And this is a this is a really interesting point in this war where both Saudi and the UAE. I mean, Saudi Arabia went into this war saying it'll be over in six weeks. We've just entered the eighth year of the war. Um, that was obviously obviously wildly over optimistic. Um, and the Biden administration has made it clear that they really want to 
end the war. The Biden administration has been putting a lot of pressure on both Saudi Arabia and the UAE to end this war. But what the Biden administration, I think, has realized is that when you only have leverage on one side and you're pushing hard on one side, what that means is that opens up a lot of space for the Houthis. And we've seen that as the Houthis are moving eastward into Marib in an attempt to take the oil and gas fields there and basically take all of North Yemen, which would eventually, essentially lead to a de facto partition. And so this, there's, I think, guarded... <laughs> optimism when it comes to this is the first time we've had a nationwide ceasefire in six years. Um, but realistically, I think the sides are still very, very far um, from from peace. And, and I think both all sides, really, because it's a it's a much more complicated com conflict than just two sides, all sides still are under the impression that they can reach their their goals by continued conflict. And you have a situation in Yemen where the economic pie continues to shrink as the number of armed groups and armed actors continues to increase. And that's a really, really difficult situation then to try to get a comprehensive peace treaty in which everybody feels that their needs and their desires and goals are met. I can I ask you a quick question before I turn to David, which is, you know, it strikes me that, the, I mean, these, these Houthi attacks on, on Abu Dhabi, which are killing people and landing on the airport, are very provocative. And, you know, it's like, what does, what, what, what are they trying to, other than just sort of, um, you know, what, what, what's the purpose of these strikes? Because it, it seems that, the, you know, the Emiratis pulled out, right? And, 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 you know, why could have antagonized them further if indeed, as Greg is indicating, you know, that there is US pressure and perhaps self-generated self pressure to sort of basically to get out of this thing that really didn't really serve their purposes. Yeah, so I think it's important to note that the Emiratis um, drew down their forces in 2019. They didn't completely leave and, and that's, that's a, I think, just useful framing to think about their continued kind of interest in the direction of the conflict and their support for um, some of the, the militias on, on the ground, even though there aren't as many Emirati forces kind of directly involved in the conflict anymore. Um, I think I, I see the, those dynamics as actually more closely related to what's going on, what was happening on the ground in, in the conflict in Yemen. So. Um, as as Greg alluded to, there was this Houth, ongoing Houthi offensive in, in um, Marib and Shabwa that had taken some territory, and it seemed like the, the Houthis had some battlefield momentum. Um, it, it seems like the Emiratis um, kind of facilitated one of the groups that they support, the Giants Brigade, got redeploying from where they were up to um, Shabwa a few months ago, and that really pushed back against um, the Houthis uh, advances. And so chronologically, we saw that happen. And then right after we saw um, the Houthi strikes that targeted the UAE. So in, so my interpretation of that is because of, you know, the order in which things happened, that it was the Houthis kind of signaling to the UAE um, not to, to, to further ramp up um, their support for the counter Houthi um, fighting around in, in northern Yemen and in, in, in Shabwa and Marib. And indeed, the Giants Brigade did then redeploy back to the south, as I understand it. So, David, so sort of picking up on something that Greg sort of, I think, alluded to, it, I mean, so do the thought experiment where you know where the United States says it, it is ending its involvement in, in the war in Yemen. Is that, and what what is the mecha mechanics for that? Is that to say the AUMF or the, or the authorization for the use of military force doesn't apply to Yemen? Is it? What, how, how would that be achieved? Yeah, I, I think one of the problems we've written ourselves into over two decades of war is that it's not entirely clear how you would do that because there's been such a proliferation of authorities. But I think at least the primary leverage point is the authorization for use of military force and would involve and I think we need to involve not just discussion of Yemen, but a broader um, repeal of the AUMF. And then for any wars the US wishes to continue, chooses to view as in its interest, a rewriting of authorizations that are um, geographically and preferably temporally limited. 
um, to those particular cases. Um, but I think even with that, there's a lot of questions about other authorities that have been cited. Um, so I think it's a large unwinding job, but I would begin with um, the AUMF as the primary authorizing force and also a useful leverage point for forcing a broader discussion of um, what wars the US is waging, what their objectives are, and why those objectives are achievable. But from a political point of view, I mean, there's been much discussion about winding down the authorization for the use of military force. And I guess Senator Tim Kaine and others have, but there, there aren't the votes for that, as I understand it. So, I mean, is there a, a more limited um, kind of uh, way of saying, well, you know, the, that that's still in effect, but we're going to country X and country Y, and let's say country Yemen, is no longer, you know, is sort of, is there a way of taking that authorization and, and sort of narrowing it in a way that, um, you know, it, it makes it more politically sustainable for the outcome that you're hoping to achieve? Yeah, I think to really make the change needed, you need um, both presidential and congressional action on the AUMF. I do think um, in the absence of that, the president could come out and give a speech about these were our objectives in Yemen. We have either achieved them or we have not. If we have not achieved them, um, they're not worth pursuing anymore. We're not conducting strikes. We won't conduct strikes. And then write that into the various strategy documents coming out of DOD and elsewhere, um, which, I mean, I would argue is somewhat what we did in Afghanistan, where there's like clearly the war in Afghanistan is not occurring, or the US war in Afghanistan, it's critical to say, is not occurring in the same way that it was um, a year or two years ago. On the other end, um, I don't think it's accurate to say that the US counterterrorism war in Afghanistan has truly been ended. There's reporting we continue to conduct um, sort of drone reconnaissance, there's been statements about tracking down and striking um, the ISIS or ISK uh, cells. Um, so there's still really a lot of this continued there. But I think you could see something like that approach to the middle ground in Yemen. I think we really do want to make it politically possible to change the actual authorization and do the work of authorizing in a real public debate, any decision to return to um, strikes in Yemen. Greg did sort of raise the sort of de facto question. So, I mean, there are some political costs in going out there and giving a speech and saying, hey, we're, we're ending this thing, particularly if two years down the road, something happens. And But as a practical matter, and David, you know these numbers better than anybody, uh, the drone program is more or less done under the Biden administration with, with like one exception in Somalia that I think you uh, uh, elicited from Africom relatively recently. So, I mean, it, what, what is the status of, of the, the drone program writ large under the Biden administration? So the drone strikes have been largely paused. Um, in Yemen, we've tracked one report in 2021, I believe, um, that hit the sort of wire services and Western press. I think there's a couple more contested claims from various local media or social media. In Somalia, we've had a couple of strikes under Biden, but nowhere near the high. Um, there's occasional things going on in Syria and Iraq. The one caution I would have, which goes to my worry with the sustainable counterterrorism framework, is a lot of people attribute this to a policy decision by Biden, but if you track the numbers, most of these trends had actually begun before the Biden administration. Um, so strikes in Yemen have been falling ever since the 2017 peak. Um, Somalia was escalating and then Biden specifically paused it, but critically it's increasing again, or we're, can, we went back to conducting strikes. So it's not a total pause. And there's discussion of a potential significant increase seemingly going around DC at the moment. Um, in Afghanistan, of course, you have the withdrawal that has sort of cut them off, at least for now. So I think, and in Iraq and Syria, 
they're largely down, but that's because the um, caliphate was, or the territorial caliphate was destroyed and therefore there's not as much need for airstrikes and fewer targets. So my worry is that um, I think some of this might be policy decision, but I think people are overestimating how much is policy decision versus the current conditions on the ground of these wars and then underestimating the potential for these to rise under whoever is the president if the conditions on the ground worsen. It is, uh, but I'm going to take a question from the audience and bit probably directed at Alex and, and Greg. Has international humanitarian law not caught up with adequately regulating the conduct of 21st century hostilities, particularly as it relates from civilian protection? This question comes from Dinesh. So I don't know, Alex or Greg, who wants to? You, for instance, Alex raised, I think, the very good point that we have really no idea how many civilians have died in Yemen compared to other, some of these other conflicts, of course, Asmat Khan and Anand Gopal, that both uh, are New America fellows, have done a lot of pioneering work in Iraq and, um, and elsewhere to, to really try and determine. But so what's your reflection on the question of uh, in, international humanitarian laws that relates to this? Obviously we're seeing this in Ukraine as well right now. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not I'm not an expert on international humanitarian yeah. law in particular, so I I, I don't want to, to misspeak about that. I think, but I think the question does point to um, this really important um, point about accountability and and needing to really have accountability at the end, or or as these conflicts um, continue and at the end of, of these conflicts on on the counterterrorism side. I think, as David said, we need a lot more transparency. We need to understand um, what actually happens in the wake wake of these these strikes and these operations, what the civilian effects are. Um, from from the perspective of the internationalized civil war, the um, unfortunately the UN Human Rights Council um, voted late last year to end a, um, a a mechanism of high level experts basically who were tracking. Um, human rights issues and, and potential war crimes in the conflict. And uh, after that happened, we saw a sharp kind of rise in the number of coalition um, airstrikes in Yemen, which is partially due to the dynamics of the conflict itself, but is certainly um, an interesting kind of trend. So I think um, that that is, a, is an unfortunate kind of decrease in accountability, but we, we would really need to see more accountability um, for all sides of the conflict, and if there's going to be any kind of sustainable end to the to that war. Greg, you were a UN official um, working on Yemen. I mean, was that part of your remit? Uh, yeah. So we were. Uh, I was on the um, the Yemen panel of experts, which is separate from the the panel that Alex just mentioned, which is the group of eminent experts, which is under the Human Rights Council, and we were under the Security Council. There was an international humanitarian law expert that worked with us, and I would agree with what it is that Alex said. the The problem often is not documenting these cases. So you know, there there are numerous cases in Yemen for the civil war of we have documentation that war crimes that torture existed. Um, there's the case in Afghanistan that, that the U.S. was involved in the drone strike that killed somebody who was not who the U.S. believed that person was. The U.S. initially said it was a righteous strike. Then the military had to walk that back um, thanks to the reporting of Asmat Khan and, and others, as you mentioned, Peter. Um, in Yemen, there are a lot of similar stories, not with the same amount of documentation, but with sufficient documentation. A uh, cleric who gives an anti-Al-Qaeda speech and then AQAP wants to meet with him, and there's a drone strike that kills the AQAP members as well as him. A deputy governor in Marib who's killed, children who are killed, all of these things. It's not a lack of documentation. It's not a lack of, of knowledge. It can be hard to find some of the transparency, but often there's some very talented journalists who are working on the ground who are bringing these things to our attention. What, what happens though is these stories come out and whether they come out from a UN document um, to the Security Council, 
um, or they come out through a New York Times report, or they come out through a local journalist. What happens is that they're very infrequently, and, and to the best of my knowledge, we don't see any officials held, held to account. We see what happened with the U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan, that this was a tragic result, but the, you know, the, proper, um, the, the proper steps were followed, as the U.S. military said. And so there's just a, a complete lack of accountability and international humanitarian law, in, at least in this area. The law might have caught up, but the law lacks any teeth. And so when that's the case, then you have a real problem in which um, you can't have, you don't have any real mechanism for bringing people to account um, when something like this happens. We're seeing it in, in Ukraine, perhaps there's talk of universal jurisdiction. We've seen that with some cases in Syria, but it's very, very small, very few, and very, very limited compared to the knowledge and, and the documentation that we do have. Just to quickly add on that, one of the things I flag in the paper and think is important is that um, we're not only lacking transparency on civilian deaths, um, the various US military combatant commands, particularly CENTCOM covering Yemen and AFRICOM um, for Somalia, have not been telling us just how many people total they killed, um, which I think is important both morally, we should know how many people we kill in our wars and what the toll is and that has impacts on these societies, whether or not they are militants and whether or not those militants actually threaten Americans um, or should be legitimate targets. Um, but secondly, even if you're tracking civilian tolls, which at least the government is legally required to report in some form, although their numbers I think often aren't great as we've seen, um, we just, aren't getting that info for combatants or people during team, um, term combatants. And one of the issues is that to really figure out has a civilian been killed, you want to know how many people total are killed and then were they civilians or not and only getting sort of trickles out of the government and what I think has become more difficult reporting recently or at least at the height in 2017 of casualties and US drone strikes in Yemen from the ground um, has made it very important the government actually tell us how many people it's killing. And we have I think they have that data. I mean, that's what at our pressure, AFRICOM gave us for this most recent strike in Somalia, but held back in the press release. They clearly have it. Um, it should be public. We have uh, just three, three or four minutes left a uh, quick question for alex relating to this so i mean tell, can you tell us what the biden administration has done in terms of reducing its support for the saudi uh, war in yemen uh, because obviously that's another way to kind of wind down our involvement um, and also and your assessment if 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 the conduct of the war has had any impact on mbs's standing in saudi negatively or, or, or neutral or positive? Um, yeah, on the, on the second question, it, it's hard to know in, in authoritarian regimes without, um, you know, good, good quality of polling what, what people think. I think MBS probably thinks that it has, or at least sees finding a facing, is a face-saving way out of, out of the conflict to be um, important so that Kind of implies that that there is public concern. Um, briefly uh, on the sort of the Biden administration and the support for the Saudi-led coalition. Um, so Biden announced when he soon after he came into office in in a big speech um, that kind of centered Yemen among some other mother um, issues. He said that the the U.S. would end offensive support for the coalition, um, and so kind of drawing this weird, interesting distinction between offensive and defensive uh, weapons and operations, which I think in practice, it seemed like the administration was was still trying to figure out after that announcement was made because there were, you know, pauses on, on some weapon sales. Some didn't go through, others have seemed like they, they will go through. Um, the U.S. is still uh, supports the coalition in the sense that um, it provides maintenance and, and parts and other kinds of support for the aircraft involved in, in the airstrikes. So um, it, I think the, the support has been dialed down, but hasn't been eliminated completely. But um, I know 
Greg also recently wrote a really interesting policy brief on the, the Biden administration's approach. So if there's time, I'd love to hear yes. Yeah, Greg, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the Biden administration put itself in an interesting position. I mean, when Biden was campaigning, he called Saudi Arabia pariah. He said that there's no redeeming social value for the Saudi royal family. Um, he made it very clear as Alex came in that he was not going to be talking to Mohammed bin Salman. His counterpart was King Salman, and that's who he would talk to. And so there was this period for the first year in 2021 where there was just significant U.S. pressure on Saudi Arabia, on Yemen. Uh, I think what Alex said is exactly right. There was this loophole that the administration tried to tried to. Uh, basically construct for itself that says we're not going to sell offensive weapons, but we will sell defensive weapons. And, you know, maybe this is a little bit of the Biden administration trying to have it both ways, sustain the relationship with Saudi Arabia while ex while extricating itself from, from this war in Yemen, which really, when you think about it, I mean, this is the U.S.'s original sin when it comes to the war in Yemen, is that the Obama administration, which of course President Biden was at the time the vice president, the Biden administration signed on to this war, signed on to support this war, and it was going to be a war that they had no control over how it was conducted. And that's a real issue for the United States. And so the Biden administration has really tried to push back against the Saudis, push back against the Emiratis, bring them to the table. The problem that the Biden administration has, has, has realized is that the Houthis have really no, no motivation to sit down and give up at the bargaining table what it is that they believe they've won on the battlefield. And so when the U.S. can apply pressure to one side but not to the other side, then you, you're essentially strengthening the other side and you're not really ending the war at all. And from a U.S. perspective, having a, a Houthi-controlled state in, in Yemen is, is not an ideal scenario either. And so the U.S. got in this war three administrations ago, and now it's still trying to find its way out of, and there's just no clear no clear exit strategy for the Biden administration. And in fact, what the Biden administration has done, we're now seeing some of those repercussions with Saudi Arabia and the UAE sort of refusing to help the US when it comes to pumping more oil or do some of the things that the US would like to see with regard to Russia and Ukraine. I mean, you have a situation where the UAE was sitting on the UN Security Council when it came time to vote on a resolution to condemn Russia, and the UAE didn't side with the US. The UAE abstained and essentially sided with Russia. That's a shocking, um, that, that's just a really shocking visual for a very strong US partner that has relied on the US security umbrella. And what has that US investment in the UAE and Saudi Arabia really paid out in diplomatic terms for the US at least recently? And the answer is frankly, not much. Well, we will uh, wrap it up there. Thank you, David, for your excellent paper, for the excellent presentation. Thank you, Alex and Greg, for commenting. And thanks to the audience for those who asked questions and also for those who, who listened. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up right now.